It's a great honor to uh, introduce both a friend, a uh, colleague, uh, Jackie Deals. Uh, Jackie is an occupational therapist uh, who uh, started at the University of Wisconsin and has been at the forefront of working on facial um, retraining, has been a, quite a bit of experience in brain plasticity and how that affects the facial nerve. And she's come up with some great techniques and it's been great to work with her uh, with patients over the years. So we're very honored to have her today. So Jackie, please take off. Ah, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Slattery. I, I'm, I'm honored to be asked and, you know, always very excited to share this information because um, it's so, it, there's, there, there are so many assumptions made about facial movement and there are assumptions because we never really know how we move our face. It works seamlessly until it doesn't, right? And when it doesn't, we, we think, okay, what did I used to do? How did I even used to move my face? How did I move it before? And so um, hopefully I'll demystify some of that and give some ideas on, um, on how to treat these patients. I'll give a, a, some information about how I treat patients, but, um, but a lot of what I want to do today is explain how I assess the patient, because I think that helps um, the doctors and the therapists and the patients understand the underlying issues that are associated with facial nerve disorders. So, um, so it's hard to believe, Dr. Slattery, that I was at the University of Wisconsin for 32 years um, and finally saw the light and I'm now in private practice. Now, a kid just a little bit, um, and uh, and enjoying it even in the co even in this time of COVID. And there's lovely Madison, Wisconsin, there in the on the screen. So facial retraining is an advanced practice clinical therapy program designed specifically for facial nerve disorders that are caused by peripheral injury to the facial nerve. So not caused by stroke, for example, but by actual injury to the facial nerve. The program, I was, I was very um, blessed really to be mentored by um, Paul Bakirida and Richard Vallier at the University of Wisconsin. And they're pioneers both in the field of brain plasticity and um, facial neuromuscular, well, neuromuscular retraining in general, but then specifically facial neuromuscular retraining. So the etiologies I see are basically the same etiologies as what you all see, um, post schwannoma, other skull-based tumors, viral causes, um, Bell's palsy, Ramsey Hunt, trauma, uh, Lyme disease, which um, is prevalent in uh, Wisconsin, uh, we, we see some congenital patients and then uh, all sorts of surgical reanimation, post-surgical reanimation patients. And here I wrote no CVA. We don't see patients who have C CVA where facial paralysis is caused by an upper motor central lesion as opposed to the peripheral neuropathy. So what do we see in this, this gentleman? What, what is he expressing to us? And so if I were there with you, you'd all be shouting out answers to me. Well, he looks upset or he looks depressed or he looks a little bit angry. Now, what would you say? He looks happy. That patient has unilateral facial paralysis. So this is his unaffected side and this is his affected side. The two sides of his face essentially communicate different experiences. And one of the things I think we don't talk about is the fact that the facial muscles um, are, are communicative muscles. So, so the facial neuromuscular system has a very different 
job than other muscles that therapists typically work with. So we work, they work with bicep, tricep, musculoskeletal injuries. And those muscles are not mediated at all by the emotional centers of the brain, whereas the facial muscles are totally mediated by the emotional centers of the brain. And so this patient not only looks happy or sad on both sides, but he feels it and he communicates that to the onlookers. And so patients are often um, very self-conscious, very depressed. There, is a, there are a lot of emotional issues that go along with facial paralysis. So what do we need for communicative facial expression? We need adequate strength. So if there's a flaccidity of the face and we don't have adequate strength, we're not gonna have good movement. We need soft tissue mobility. So if there are contractures or spasms in the facial muscles, we're not gonna have good movement either. And we need precise coordination amongst the 23 plus muscles that create various facial expressions. Without the coordination, we don't get good expression. So from the therapy perspective, and I touched on this a moment ago, we're working here with a peripheral nerve versus an orthopedic or musculoskeletal injury. There, there's either a lack of nerve conduction in a flaccid patient or in a delayed recovery um, situation, you'll get you can get an you can get aberrant nerve conduction that causes uh, abnormal movements. The facial muscles are unique in the body, and that in that they move skin. Like whoever thinks about that, they don't move bones around joints. They don't move or lift heavy objects. They simply move skin. Um, I can move my bicep. If I flex my bicep, I move, I'm, I'm moving my bone. I am not moving my skin. And so we, it, it, it's, it, it, it's um, hard for the patient to understand sometimes that they're not just kind of trying to exercise their muscles and get them strong. But we have this variability in movement that's created by the different, um, the different expressions that are created by the various movements of the facial muscles moving the skin. Facial retraining is often counterintuitive to other therapy interventions because increased strength does not necessarily improve movement and, or expression. And so, um, you know, I'm, I've been talking to you for a few minutes and I'm kind of just talking normally, but when I was introduced, I didn't say, oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. We don't move our face big. We move it in many ways. We have great breadth of movement, but we don't have great amplitude of movement. So facial expression is never a high amplitude movement, but very subtle, low amplitude, and again, very coordinated. The, the misunderstanding of this concept leads to a misalignment of the disease process, what happens, and the therapy provided. And that often results in poor outcomes and dissatisfaction on the part of the patient. The facial muscles themselves are different from skeletal muscles. They lack muscle spindles. So a muscle spindle is a physiologic mechanism within the muscle that responds to various forms of, of um, stretch, vibration, tapping. So certain modalities elicit a contraction of the muscles. Um, but because the facial muscles don't have them, those typical modalities used by therapists don't work in the facial muscles. They're highly resistant to fatigue, they're slow to atrophy. They have very small move, uh, motor units, which allows for a great deal of specificity in how the face moves. 
Um, and they have soft tissue. Most of the, it's the attachments of these muscles are soft tissue attachments. So the muscles um, attach to the soft tissue of the face and they, they're, they're like a woven fabric, especially in the lower one third of the face. They're like a woven fabric. So it's even difficult to dissect one from the other in some cases. And like I said before, they receive emotional as well as volitional cortical input. So the, the retraining program um, is based on post-acute rehabilitation. And that is um, after the nerve begins to recover. And I'll cover that a little bit more in a minute. Um, it provides continuity of care after facial nerve injury from whatever cause. Uh, and especially after um, uh, surgery, acoustic neuroma surgery, where the patients are just, they're, they're waiting. They're waiting for their nerve to recover. Um, so we provide continuity of care for those patients. Um, it relies on new learning versus simply spontaneous recovery. We work with coordination and precision as opposed to strengthening and mass movement. And we see patients intensively in the clinic, periodically. Uh, it's not the kind of program where we'll see a patient two or three times a week. Uh, depending on where they are in the program, we may see the patient <clears throat> once every six weeks, once every two months. Um, but in the meantime, they are practicing a, a, a very uh, specific home program on their own at home that has been developed specifically for their facial function. Everybody's face is different. And what well, we're all, our faces are all different to begin with. And our faces are more different than our elbow joint is different. And so everybody gets a tailor-made program based on their own function, based on their understanding of the disability, based on their psychosocial uh, the uh, psychosocial impact that the disability has had on them and based on their aptitude. Uh, there are four main functional categories of uh, patients that, that I work with. So we have the, the flaccid, whoop, hang on, the flaccid patient, which is the one that we think of most often when we think of facial paralysis. We have the paretic patient where the movement is just beginning to return. It's just beginning to come back. Um, and then we have the synkinetic patient where the patient has abnormal movement caused by what's thought to be misdirection of regrowth of the facial nerve during recovery. You know, and that is the, the bulk of my caseload is with the synkinetic patient. And um, then there's another entire group um, of post-surgical reanimation and reconstruction patients. I'll be touching on that very, very briefly today. That's an entire concept all to, unto itself. So in a typical delayed recovery after an acoustic neuroma, and this, this young lady had an acoustic neuroma, um, we see a, a a, a sequence that's quite, it's quite typical and predictable if recovery is delayed. And uh, this, this gal's husband took these pictures as she was recovering. This is 10 days post-op. Mm -hmm. And you can see she has, she has a, a droop, a flaccid paralysis on, the, on her right side. And here's two months. We're starting to get some good recovery where the the angle of the mouth is coming up. At four months, her smile looks quite good. And so she's, she's on her way. This is interesting to me though, because if you look at the mid face, on her left side, you can see that she has um, good bulking of the mid face and the, the zygomatic muscles. But on the right face, she doesn't have nearly as much bulking in that area, and yet, we still see full teeth show there. So you can see that you don't need full 100% strength of the muscle in order to achieve a full smile. So this is very interesting to me. Um, 
because you, you would think that you needed to have an equal amount of activity on both sides to achieve this type of a smile. So this is four months. At six months, uh, we see she's got good bulking of the cheek. Uh, the angle of the mouth is definitely up, but there's some kind of a change happening here. And at 15 months, um, well, let me just back up a second. At 14 months, I got the phone call. Hi, I was referred to you. My face uh, after surgery, it was getting better and better and better. And now it's getting worse again. And so you'll hear that terminology, and I'm sure you've all heard it. Now it's getting worse again. So when she came in for her initial evaluation, she looked like this. So what happened here between four months and 15 months? At four months, we have almost full teeth show. Now we're seeing less teeth show, deeper nasolabial fold, uh, quite bulky cheek, especially compared to, to um, how it was at the four month point. So what's happened in this period of time that causes her to think that she is getting worse again? So what the patient is thinking is that they're regressing back to how they were in this time frame at the beginning time frame. So what happens dep depends on how you look at it. So if we look at this, this illustration here, you can look at it in two ways. Um, and if I saw a show of hands, I would ask how many people see um, a face in this right there? And how many people see a woman walking in a park? Depending on how you look at it, you'll come up with a different answer to the question. So how do we look at the face and how do we interpret this facial function right here? At first glance to the uninstructed eye, it looks like they have the same thing, right? You look at their face, a quick look, the angle of the mouth is, is down in both cases, it looks like a facial droop. Um, and yet there's a very different quality about it. So let's look closer. So on this gentleman, we can see that there's a flaccid paralysis. The eye is a giveaway here, right? So we've got um, quite a ptosis here at the lower eyelid, but we have no bulking in the cheek at all. And if we look at the lady, we see that she has a very, uh, a, a very tight cheek and so tight in fact that it's actually shiny. Um, and then there's a sort of a strange pattern going around the, on around the brow where the affected brow is actually higher than the unaffected brow as opposed to the gentleman whose affected brow is lower than the unaffected brow. Let's look further. If we look even closer, we can see that the, we've got this droop here at the angle of the mouth and this jowling occurring here. And in the woman, we can see these very tight cords of the platysma muscle. So we've got platysmal banding that is pulling down and depressing the angle of the mouth. And that looks like this. So we have opposite situations here. We have a flaccid paralysis versus a synchinesis. They look at, at, at face glance, they look like they're the same thing. So the interpretation of what's going on with the patient is incredibly important um, to providing the right kind of therapy for these patients because really they need opposite things, right? The, the gentleman needs stronger muscles and the woman needs better coordination and a decrease sync of synchinesis. And I hope that, that this makes sense. I don't see anybody's head nodding, so I'm going to assume. And here we see in a pucker movement, um, uh, the gentleman doesn't have any um, 
um, flexion, especially of that upper lip during the pucker. But if, but if you look at the woman's mouth and if you, you discard the, disregard the fact that everything is shifted toward her synchinetic side, the mouth is actually quite round the angle of the mouth is being depressed by both the platysma and the depressor anguli oris. And we can see that the shift, the shift of the, the philtrum always goes toward the stronger side. And in a synkinetic phase, that is often the synkinetic side being the stronger side. So here we see she's got um, synkinesis of the upper cheek, the levators, the zygomatics, um, probably buccinator and the the depressors and platysma. So what do we do with these patients? So for the flaccid patient, early intervention is eye care. So making sure that their eye is healthy, protected, lubed, um, making sure, especially in a case, a severe case like this, that the patient is seeing is being followed closely by ophthalmology. Um, there are various techniques that we can help the patients with, um, such as um, how to patch their eye, how to tape it up from the bottom, always following the ophthalmologist's instructions for that. We teach them gentle stroking for, and this is for sensory awareness, where um, the affected side of the face is not sending any movement signals to the sensory um, somatosensory cortex. And so the brain isn't getting the signal that the muscles are there or that the face is alive. And so by stroking, we're at least maintaining um, some sensory input to the brain. And that has been shown in rat models to improve the outcome as the nerve regenerates um, with, so that the patient, the patient, the rats had less synkinetic whisker, whisking movements um, with a, a recovery after a nerve transection and repair. This is not intended to stimulate movement at all. Um, it just provides that sensory input. And then my advice to the patients is to let it heal. If there's no innervation, there can be no exercise um, because there isn't any, any neural conduction. So if there's no signal getting through to the muscles from the brain, no matter how many times you try or how hard you try to move those muscles, they will not move. When a patient tries to move their face very, uh, very in, in a very efforted way, what they're really doing is they're increasing the asymmetry by hyperactivating the unaffected side. And so they're actually decreasing their symmetry even more, strengthening the unaffected side and, um, and habitually learning some bad patterns. Um, I use, I use analogies with the patients because every single patient that we see after the diagnosis of Bell's palsy or, or, or paralysis after acoustic or whatever, they are gonna go home and they're gonna just try to crank that thing and to move it as much as they can. And so I will use analogies with them. And I think that these are really helpful for the patients uh, to teach them what they're dealing with because they look at it as a muscle weakness as opposed to a uh, lack of conduction. So what I'll tell them is it's kind of like if you have a lamp on your table and you unplug the lamp, how many times will you have to flip the switch for the bulb to go on? And so that gets their brain thinking in a slightly different way that, oh yeah, it can't possibly work right now. That nerve is gonna take X number of weeks or months to heal. Um, another analogy that I'll use with some people is um, if they've broken their leg, for example, and it's in a cast, what kind of exercises are they doing to strengthen their, their leg muscles or to strengthen the bone? And of course, they're not doing any exercises. They're allowing that to heal. 
And so speaking in analogies, I think helps the patients kind of calm down and um, with Bell's palsy, for example, given the fact that 80 to 85% recover completely and spontaneously within three months, they have, they have a time frame where they're just letting it heal and letting it rest. Uh, we begin retraining when, I mean, actual retraining, retraining when tone increases or there are small movements evident. No electrical stimulation ever with any category of facial paralysis. So the research findings are that it's not effective in treating facial paralysis. So number one, right off the bat, not effective. Some animal studies were uh, done in, I believe it was in the 70s and 80s that showed that it may interfere, stimulation may interfere with the development of the growth cone and neural re-innervation. Re it can reinforce abnormal movement patterns by activating and stimulating more muscles than are intended in a, in a normal isolated sort of facial expression. It doesn't train function. E-STEM doesn't train function and it doesn't train expression. It just flexes a muscle. We find anecdotally, those of us who've been in the field for a long period of time find that um, electrical stimulation causes more mass action and abnormal movement patterns than patients who don't get electrical stimulation early on. And it doesn't generate an emotion. And we really have to pair in facial retraining, we have to pair the emotion with the motion. So I always tell patients that facial expression doesn't come from a place of motion, it comes from a place of emotion. And it's really important to, um, for them to grasp and for us all to grasp that concept. For late intervention on flaccid paralysis, um, will initiate um, at the point in time where, where we think we should be seeing either full recovery or at least partial recovery. So with Bells, that would be three months. For acoustic neuroma, I have 12 months here, but I think that there, there's definitely some, some debate on that. And I've, I've actually changed that. I need to change this slide. Um, but I'll start to see patients post-acoustic at five or six months. And I know that with um, a lot of the new surgical reanimation techniques, those are actually being done in that time frame. And so we're having a lot of discussions right now about when is the proper time to um, surgically reanimate the face. And those are discussions that we won't get into here today. In, with late intervention, we focus on symmetry of movement. So if the patient has a little bit of movement coming back, we use that little bit of movement and have the patient recreate that movement just to the extent that they can do it easily. So their brain relearns the pattern of movement without going into a movement that is um, done with more effort than can be easily achieved because if a patient starts to move too, too forcefully, they'll pull in overflow from neighboring muscles. Uh, we teach precise movements using sensory feedback. We use, sometimes use EMG biofeedback for evaluation and training in this period of time. And then I uh, mentioned surgical reanimation. If a patient has gone in, in in my practice, if a patient has gone 12, 13, 14 months and is still completely flaccid, I feel they need to be um, assessed for surgical reanimation. Here's um, my, my patient, Paul. Paul had Bell's palsy. This was Paul in uh, November of 02. And uh, you can see he's completely flaccid. His eye was just, it was just, um, his eye was just a mess. And uh, even though he uh, was seeing an ophthalmologist, he wasn't very good at following 
the protocol. And so very concerned for him, but uh, he did well. So, um, so here he is in 03, and this is actually the picture that, that I showed um, when I did the comparison between this and the synkinetic lady. Um, and here he is um, almost three months or uh, I guess actually over two, just over two months post. And you can see that he's starting to gain function. I was not actively seeing him in this period. I was just having him come in to monitor because if there's no movement, then there's no exercise. And so I was trying to help guide him with his eye care, but we were not doing any active movements at this point. And he is recovering. And then in May, so six plus months later, he looked like this. I would love to sit here and say, this is what facial retraining does, but this is spontaneous recovery. It's delayed. He is a little bit delayed. And if you look closely, you can see that he did develop just a little bit of synkinesis. We've got a tight platysmal band here and we've got a little bit of synkinesis in the affected eye when he puckers his mouth and when he smiles. But um, this is spontaneous recovery. And, um, and this was the end of his treatment. He was, not, he was very happy with his outcome. So uh, that's the story of Paul. Paresis is when movement is starting to come back. We're starting to see tone. Um, symmetry is increasing and there's no synkinesis. And I have yet in, par in parentheses, because if it's a delayed recovery, there will be synkinesis. There will be synkinesis. And here's a very nice lady, post-acoustic, who came in. Um, um, her, she was um, about two years post. And this was her initial evaluation on day one. So at that point, we had people coming in for two and a half days of treatment, 12 hours over a three-day period of time in the clinic. Um, and this was her initial evaluation on day one. You can see she has good pucker, pretty good pucker. Um, no real synkinesis. A lot of difficulty finding her mid face here. Um, she did have a little bit of nasolabial fold coming back. So I knew that she had movement and she was re um, And yet she was having trouble, I would say, locating her muscles. And then on day three, this is what she looked like. And it looks like a miraculous recovery in two days, but really what happened through the retraining process and the education that's provided, she was able to find her muscles. And because we don't know how our facial, our facial muscles move in, um, before we have paralysis. So, so we all know that volitional facial movement is different than spontaneous, right? Because how you look in a photo when you smile is not the same, usually for most of us, as it is when somebody catches us smiling spontaneously, right? So it's different. It comes from a different part of the brain. And so when I was able to teach her where the muscles were, and have her focus on her unaffected side and how it moved on the unaffected side, how it felt on the unaffected side. And there's a way that we guide patients in this way. She was able to learn how to access the muscles that were there that had come back. Um, I can't see any of you, I don't think. Let me just see, maybe I can, no. Um, but I'm gonna actually have you try this on your own while we're sitting here talking about this paretic face. So if I ask you to um, wrinkle your nose up as though something smells bad, I call this the snarl, and you're accessing the levator muscles here. And assuming that none of you have facial paralysis, when you do that bilaterally, you can, ah, thank you. When you do that bilaterally, there, there's really no problem accessing those muscles bilaterally. So now everyone try doing that on the right side by itself. And now everyone try doing it on the left side by itself. 
<laughs> so Dr. House, you, you're a lot better on your right side than your left side, right? So here's the question. Why can we do it bilaterally? No paralysis, no issues. And yet most of us, and I've done, this is not a real study, but when I'm giving lectures to student groups, and you know, there are a hundred students in the, in the lecture hall, and I do this with them, typically it's three or four out of a hundred. That's my unscientific research. Three out of a hundred that can access, they can isolate each side independently. So what is it about our brain that can access one side and not the other when we know we have full movement? And so these are the things that I teach patients. Do we have a neural connection and why can't they find it? And I teach them how to find it. And Dr. House, next time we're together, I, I will teach you on your left side how to find that muscle. It's really interesting because we always assume if we don't see movement, it must be paralyzed. But very often it is that the patient can't find the address of that muscle. And here is a patient, this patient was 26 years post Bell's and she's smiling and she was being evaluated for, uh, for facial re, uh, uh, reanimation, surgical reanimation procedure. And the physician sent her to me first just to see what my, what my input would be. And she clearly has tone. You can see she has a nasolabial fold. Uh, it looks like she's drooping, but this, in the absence of jowling in this aged woman, to me indicates rather than a flaccid paralysis, which we know she doesn't have anyway because she has the nasolabial fold, right? But no jowling. So to me, this, in, this indicates um, synchinesis of the depressor anguli oris. So that's just a little downturn at the angle of the mouth. So in the, this was her initial evaluation. Actually, I only saw her one time. And um, in, I had asked her to smile with her lips apart. And then I told her something very simple. I said, okay, now I'm gonna ask you to do it again. This time, instead of smiling with your mouth, I want you to smile with your cheeks. And this is what she did. Patients don't know that the smile muscles are located in the cheeks and they lift. And the bottom of the smile muscles, the inferior aspect attaches to the angle of the mouth. And so when the, when the zygomatic muscles flex in the cheek, they raise the mouth. The mouth does not make the motion. And so this was sort of an astonishing thing and it was astonishing to her too. And so we worked for a little while and she went on to get Botox to, to deal with some of these, the synkinetic issues. Um, but it's really, um, it's a very interesting case, isn't it? Just by giving the patient a different way of thinking about it, we can access the movement in a different way than, than they had been doing before. Synkinesis is the biggest um, um, group, patients with synkinesis, that's the biggest group that I work with. So synkinesis causes abnormal synchronization of facial movement where muscles other than the ones we intend to move are contracting simultaneously, causing distortion in expression. The distortion often looks like a flaccid paralysis, but it can actually be depression, active depression during active elevation. And so because the muscles move the skin, the skin is gonna move whichever way the muscles are flexing. So what we do in the treatment of synkinesis is suppressing or inhibiting, relaxing the synkinetic movements. And that in turn de decreases the distortion, improves coordination, and functional movement patterns.
Synchinesis is almost always misunderstood. And that can lead to ineffective and, in, and inappropriate therapy. And, and for therapists who have been in the field for a long time, um, they have not been trained in, in, in facial movement at all. In terms of uh, a therapist's caseload, a therapist will go, most therapists go their entire career without ever seeing anyone with facial paralysis. With, and, and, and I, I mean, even flaccid paralysis, let alone synchinesis. And so what they do is they take the techniques that they've learned in school and they apply them, such as electrical stimulation, they apply them to what appears to them to be a, a flaccid paralysis. Um, and it's important, and when I teach therapists, just re reinforcing this concept that this is a peripheral neuropathy that causes neuropraxia, um, in most cases, where there just is no nerve conduction. And then in synchinesis, we have this aberrant nerve conduction caused by what's thought to be that aberrant regeneration of the nerve causing wrong connections. And that the limited excursion is the result of a lack of mobility and coordination, not a lack of strength. And um, this is very counterintuitive to other therapeutic interventions. And again, like I said before, increasing the strength does not increase movement and expression. So somebody who has synchinesis, when they typically when they increase their strength, they also increase the synchinesis, which further limits the excursion and decreases the overall expression. There are three parts to the training of synchinesis, patient education, soft tissue mobilization, and coordinating movement patterns. Patient education is absolutely key for them to understand where the muscles are, like we like like you saw in that last the patient that I showed, where I had her flex her cheek muscles. Just knowing where the where the smile muscle is located, where are the muscles located? What do they do? This is all basic stuff that we never learn, because facial movement is is by and large emotional and spontaneous. How do the muscles coordinate for expression? Each muscle has a singular biomechanical action and also a singular emotional signature. So the zygomatic muscles don't contract when we're sad, right? So if we're happy, we flex zygomatic. If we're happy, we don't flex depressor angulioris or levator. Soft tissue mobilization is foundational to these synchinetic patients because they typically have contracture and spasm in the muscles. Um, and the, the muscles are, are hyperactive and tight and a tight muscle does not move well. And there is a, a wide range of different soft tissue mobilization, stretching techniques that we teach the patients depending on where their um, uh, the tightness and contracture is. Um, we teach the patient that the abnormal movement distorts the expression. And here you can see on this picture, uh, this is Emily and she's smiling. You can see she has very good mid facial movement, but she also has um, in the red arrows, the red arrows are designating the synchinetic areas. And so she has a lot of restriction um, that's caused by the skin being pulled in multiple other directions than where she's intending to, to go. We do this detailed vector analysis with the patient in real time during the evalu evaluation. So I, I do this on a laminated sheet with the muscles. And, um, and I ask this question of the patient, when we do the 
I have the green arrows designating the movements I'm asking the patient to make, and then the red arrows designating the movements that are also occurring that are not occurring on the unaffected side. And then I ask the question, so Emily, which side is actually moving more? And they, they, she stops and thinks, and she looks, and she says, my right side. And then I look at her and, I, and I'll say something like, so how weird is that? If that's your paralyzed side, why is it moving more? And then I have the opportunity to explain that the therapy we're going to be doing for the synchinesis is one of subtraction rather than addition. We're going to inhibit and decrease those red arrows, those, mo those movements, in order to allow the movement that we're asking her to do to go through a more normal range of motion with no restriction, with no antagonist pull on, on the skin in a different direction. So we work with precision here, not power. And this, I, this concept Dr. Slattery mentioned before, brain plasticity, finding the address of the appropriate muscles. This is like learning how to golf. We're not making big movements necessarily, but we're learning small sequential tasks that we practice in order to improve the whole. The more the patient understands about the vectors, the better they'll do the better they'll do. They'll stop trying so hard because in a synkinetic phase where the angle of the mouth is depressed, what they're doing is they're trying as hard as they can to get the angle to go up by moving their mouth. And that doesn't work. Um, a very, uh, uh, an important and overlooked muscle is the buccinator. And the buccinator muscle is located, is one muscle, it's located in the, um, in the mucosa. So it's deep in the face and um, it is a facial muscle, but it mostly assists in maintaining the food in the oral cavity as we eat. The action of the buccinator is it, it retracts the angle of the mouth, but it brings it close in to the teeth. In doing so, it closes the angle of the mouth. And so if I flex my buccinator, it does this. It basically clamps the angle of the mouth shut, which is great while we're eating because we don't want food to fall out, but not so good while we're smiling. So if I, if I smile and I flex my buccinator, watch it, watch what happens. And you'll see my smile muscles don't change, but watch what happens. So loose, tight, loose. And so when a patient uses a mirror, which I don't use, by the way, we use the, we use proprioceptive, proprioceptive internal feeling rather than visual feedback. They see that the corner doesn't go up, but they don't feel that the angle of the mouth is going, is retracting in against the teeth. But let me show you what this looks like. So here's a patient post bells with synchinesis. I'm having her close her eyes and you can see the buccinator contracting smile. and now yeah. I'm having her smile and, and you can see this very smile. significant contraction and release. of buccinator that's limiting her ability to open her mouth during her smile. That is compared to her close unaffected side. Open. And, and closing close. the eyes, nothing and going on here. And smile. And, and nothing release. going on with her smile. And jaw open a little and Smile again and release. So for this um, movement coordination, movements are small because they mimic normal expression. 
We want to, we want to recreate normal as much as possible. We're not trying to overextend the muscles. We want to get normal expression and so small amplitude movements achieve that. Slow. At the beginning, we do them slowly so the brain can find its way. What am I trying to inhibit? What am I trying to activate? Inhibiting the synkinetic muscles, teaching the patient what not to move as opposed to what to move and using that proprioceptive feedback like I mentioned before to feel what is not seen by the eye. This is also helpful in practicing the home program because then the patient can do it anywhere. And we use the unaffected side as the model. So the proprioceptive feedback increases, the accu increases accuracy. It also minimizes the negative emotional response that patients get when they look in a mirror. So a patient with facial paralysis is not happy about looking in the mirror. They don't like what they see. So this takes away that totally sidesteps this emotional, uh, negative emotional experience response, and it incorporates easily into the home pro program. We attend to the unaffected side to model the movement correctly so that the brain can relearn, ah, that's what I'm trying to achieve. That's, that's the ease that I'm trying to achieve. Um, so um, I think I just talked about this, um, but one thing I do here I, that I wanna mention is um, midway down here, I ask the patient how small they can make that movement as opposed to how big. How small can you pucker your lips and still know you're puckering? And here's Emily. Um, Emily did not have Botox uh, at this point. She did go on to have Botox later, but this is a year of working on retraining. And so it's improved, it's better. It never is 100%. I, I don't know of any technique, uh, including neuromuscular retraining that can restore this to uh, a patient to 100% function again. Um, in, I'm looking at the time. So, um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Let's see. All right, so this is a uh, patient 18 months post Bell's palsy. I'm having her snarl. You can see that she's activating her levators, but having trouble finding them and, and at the same time bringing in platysma, uh, mentalis, oculi. And she's working really hard to achieve this. You can see that. And then here's three months later where she learned how to isolate this muscle. And, release. and no Botox on this patient either. Um, this is a patient uh, that I saw, and this is just one very, very brief case of somebody who had a masseter muscle transposition. I saw her three months. I didn't see her. This is the picture three months before surgery. She was out at a bar with her friends after work. And this is five years after surgery, which is her initial evaluation with me. Um, the op report, this was a long time ago. The op report was unclear, but I, I think that her facial nerve probably was sacrificed um, and never, it, it was not repaired. At five years post with a flaccid face like this, um, there was really nothing that we could do for in, in terms of retraining. And she went on to have um, a masseter, um, masseter muscle transposition. And um, she's biting to achieve this. And this is one of many reanimation techniques that are um, available right now. So she looked much better. This is interesting. You can see a little line here on this, uh, this picture here. The, her local uh, town did a newspaper story on her and her recovery. And uh, this was a clipping from her newspaper that she sent me, which was, I think, really great. Um, we do use Botox and facial neuromuscular retraining. 
um, concurrently. I like to work with patients with retraining first to teach them some of these techniques. And then we can use the effect of the Botox to further help the brain learn more appropriate movement patterns. So this is Guy and uh, he is, he had bells with synchinesis and you can see he's got a really significant platysmal banding and depression at the angle of the mouth uh, during smile, during pucker. Um, and I often will help um, assess the patients for, with the retraining patients where I'd like to see the Botox injected so that we can maximize their retraining after, after they had the Botox. So this, this was his Botox plan. And then this is how he looked. This is a, some photos he took at home and sent to me um, about two weeks after his Botox injection. So it works really, really well. And it does seem to improve the motor uh, learning. So when to refer? For a viral, uh, post-viral, uh, Bell's palsy, Ramsey hunt, if they're not fully recovered by three months, go ahead and refer for neuromuscular retraining. Skull-based tumors, it's gonna be very, very individual. Um, some, re well, it's across the board, as you know. Um, as soon as there's a little bit of movement, I mean, unless movement comes back a week later, then we're not gonna to have to see those patients. But, but if they've gone three months and they don't have full recovery, we let it recover just a, a little bit more, maybe at the five or six month point, um, go ahead and refer. For the reanimation procedures, it really is procedure dependent, uh, depending on which procedure is done. We'll see uh, faster um, reanimation with a masseteric transfer, for example, than we will with a cross-face nerve graft. Um, when you're writing a script for uh, a patient who has facial paralysis, whether it's flaccid paralysis, just for just, and, and in those cases, the therapist should be doing mo mostly education and eye care. Um, if you write on this script, facial retraining, post whatever, the etiology is no e-stem, right? No e-stem. Otherwise, most of the therapists you send patients to will do e-stem on these patients. The overall um, frequency and duration of treatment is 18 months to three years. It's a long program. It really does take time for the brain to learn. They are working on it daily. The clinic visits decrease as the patient becomes proficient. Um, and uh, maybe in the last year, I'll see a patient once or twice, and that's all. We teach the patients to become their own best therapist. We teach them how to analyze them themselves. And we've estimated that about 90% of the treatment is completed by the patient on their own at home through the home program. We videotape and photograph the patients. We've found in general, they improve one to two grades on the House Brackman scale. I would say nobody, obviously nobody gets to a grade one. Somebody who comes in at a grade four or a five will get to a grade three. It's, we sometimes get people back to a grade, we'll get people up to a grade two, um, but we're in that category where, you know, you can talk about a high three and a low three. Um, it just depends how well they do with the synkinetic uh, reduction. Um, a nice study that was done by Ross and Nidzalski showed that gains that were acquired through retraining were retained even after the patient stopped doing the retraining. And uh, we, we need a lot more studies in this field um, to demonstrate its effectiveness. So in summary, facial neuromuscular retraining is very much a patient-centered program providing good continuity of care. It's cost-effective in that the patients are seen um, uh, at long intervals between treatment. They're not seen frequently in the clinic and it provides specific retraining based on the unique characteristics of the neuro, uh, facial neuromuscular system. 
I don't know who said it, but it's true. Facial muscles are the only ones whose principal role is to move other people. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.